our Yam Levin and Wendy Gowen, who I get the pleasure of working with at the State of Arizona Research Library and State Archives. I feel so lucky and I have seen this presentation from them, so you're in for a real treat. Uh, they are here with us for Arizona Genealogy 101. Now, just a little background about Wendy and Yam. Wendy is the lead reference and photograph archivist for the Arizona State Archives. And in her role, she provides access, reference, and research assistance for the archives collections. And then Yam Levin is the Arizona Collection Librarian for the State of Arizona Research Library. And in her role, she collects materials such as city directories, books, periodicals, uh, and just generally maintains our Arizona collection. And she is also our main liaison for our Family Search Scanning Partnership. So Yam and Wendy, you can go ahead and take it away. Great. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Yam Levin, um, and uh, I'm going to be starting the presentation, and then um, Wendy is going to jump in. So I'm just going to share my screen. OK, and hopefully everybody can see that, can see my screen. We can, Yam. Okay, great. Okay, so here we go. Let's get started with Arizona Genealogy 101. Um, so this is a photo of our building. We're located um, in Phoenix near the Capitol off of Madison and 19th. Um, we are open um, for appointments. So if you see things in this presentation and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I would love to come in and look at this stuff, you will have to make an appointment, but it's really easy and we'll explain how to do that. Um, before we dive deep into the information, I do have um, this slide to help give you tips for how to ask effective research and reference questions. Um, uh, and so basically, whenever you're uh, asking for information from a librarian or an archivist, um, more information is better than less information. So tell us the names of the people you're researching, tell us as much information about the location of where those people lived, um, any dates that you have, and most importantly, what exactly you're looking for. Because you could send us a question so, and say, oh, I'm looking for, for, for information about my great grandparent. And it's like, well, we have all kinds of stuff. So please be as specific as you can. Um, one of the things that I would recommend uh, for you to remember from this presentation, if you remember nothing else, nothing at all, the first thing is this research guide. This lists everything that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and uh, so you have the link on the screen, but it's also on the handout that was emailed to you. Um, and this pretty much has, like I said, everything that we're going to talk about today. So let's start with the State of Arizona Research Library. Um, we have all sorts of resources available um, for all kinds of research and specifically genealogy research. So as you can see, we have physical collections and we also have online tools. I'm gonna to be talking mostly about our online tools. So keep in mind that a lot of the things that I'll be talking about, we also have a physical collection that it either has things that have not been digitized or things that we can't digitize due to copyright laws. So I would highly recommend taking a look at what's already been digitized. And if you can't find what you're looking for, feel free to reach out to us. So first off, um, I just wanna mention that we are a um, part of the Federal uh, Depository Library Program. So we are a repository of federal documents. Um, these are often documents that are overlooked in genealogy research, but it's so, so helpful. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, I'm not gonna get into this uh, presentation, but, or excuse me, into deep into, into federal documents and the collection, um, but there is a great um, presentation that was recorded from last year's Arizona Genealogy Day, uh, which included a presentation by Janelle. Um, and uh, that's on our YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out. Um, so just really quickly, when should you consider searching through federal documents? If your ancestor uh, did any of these things or is included in 
any of these categories, you should definitely consider searching through federal documents. And again, that presentation is on our YouTube channel. You can access it anytime. Um, and uh, Janelle and our other colleague, um, Brittany, will explain how to sift through federal documents and state documents that I'll mention a little bit later on. Okay, so now let's talk about um, the Digital Arizona Library, which is where we keep our many, well, most of our digitized items, excuse me, all of our digitized items are eventually fall into one of these categories. Most of it is in the Arizona Memory Project, which includes uh, digitized newspapers, digitized materials from the Arizona collection, the collection I manage, which includes city and business directories, yearbooks, historical books, periodicals, materials from communities of worship. It also features state publications, brand indexes, and then two other resources worth considering looking into are the Arizona Biographical Database and the Arizona Legislators Then and Now Database. And I will explain in detail what all this means. So the Arizona Memory Project, just so you have a, a broad understanding of what it is, um, is a platform, a digital platform that has um, not just material that's digitized from our library, but we also partner with other institutions. Um, so there's so much information to come through there. Um, and so we're gonna kind of talk about um, search strategies and the types of materials that you can find there. So this is the homepage of the Arizona Memory Project. It's long, so I cut it up into two chunks. Um, and so as you can see, there's a lot going on um, and we're gonna talk about all of this. Um, what I'd like for you to notice is on the bottom right screen where it says need help getting started. So this is a close up of the need help getting started. Um, and what's really great about this page, and this is the second thing for you to remember if you remember nothing else, from this presentation. This is the other thing that I would highly recommend remembering. And again, there's a link to this um, on, our, on the handout that was emailed to you. Um, if you click on Need Help Getting Started, it'll open up another page that says Tips for Getting Started. And if you notice, there's a page for genealogists. And if you click on that, there's a whole page that explains all of the different resources that are available on the Arizona Memory Project for specifically for genealogy research. So again, everything that I'm going to talk about here will be covered um, on the website. Okay, so first let's talk about newspapers. Um, there's several ways to find um, this collection of digitized newspapers. Um, the first one is if you look at the, the top image on your screen um, that has the purple circle around the word collection, you can search for it there. Um, it will, there will also be on the home page, there's also a, um, a little icon that says Arizona Historical Digital Newspapers. That's that little box on the bottom left. And then once you click on that, that is the page that you see um, on the uh, right part of your screen. So why newspapers? Different presenters today have talked about how important newspapers are, um, and you might think to yourself, well, you know, um, I have an ancestor and maybe they live somewhere, but I don't know if they actually did anything worth mentioning in these papers. But the thing is, is that you never know. And actually, this is from the Snowflake Herald um, from 1923. And as you can see, newspapers are incredibly name heavy. And so it is highly recommended to search through newspapers that were um, from the location of where your ancestors were and you never know. And because these are historic newspapers, lots of times there's um, newspapers for smaller towns or smaller cities and it's, it's worth taking a look and seeing what's available. Um, next, city and bus business directories. Um, we have several collections of um, city and business directories on the Arizona Memory Project. Um, and again, you can, there's a button on the homepage that says city directories. That's what that um, icon uh, on the left side of your screen is. And then on the right um, is what happens when you click on that. And as you can see, there's a few directories up top and then there's a few collections on the bottom. So let's say that you wanted to 
find a city directory from, uh, um, from the city of Globe. So there's a very nice um, uh, collection search at the top of the page. So I typed in Globe um, and then uh, the search results are organized by year. So year first, once you search for a city. Um, and then as you can see, they're all listed um, down below. Um, and then once you click on one, what's really fantastic is that because these are PDFs, these have all been OCR'd, which means that let's say you're looking for someone whose last name is Crawford, you can just use the little search icon once you open up the directory for the year that you want, you could type in Crawford and then it'll show up. So it'll take you right to that place. So you don't have to look through every single little page unless you really want to. Maybe some people enjoy looking through um, city directories page by page. Um, but if you know what you're searching for, everything has been OCR'd. And that goes for everything that's on the Arizona Memory Project. Yearbooks, another fantastic resource, right, um, for researching and maybe finding pictures or little tidbits about your ancestors. Um, we have, like the city directories, we have multiple collections. Um, of yearbooks um, and these are organized by the name of the high school. So once you search for a yearbook, right? So on the, um, on the left side of your screen is several collections that we have. And then we have the sub collection, which is the list of all of the different yearbooks. As you can see, they're organized alphabetically by the name of the high school or college or university. And yearbooks are fantastic resources, but I just do want to uh, offer two examples of caution. <laughs> so sometimes, um, you know, we're all human and we make mistakes. So sometimes there's little uh, issues with people sometimes forget how to put things maybe in alphabetical order. So for example, in the photo uh, and the picture on, on your left, um, if you notice, all the names are alphabetical by last name, except for some reason Betty Wallace is sandwiched between um, Robert um, Costoy and Philomena Coda. So it happens, so just be wary of that. And also if you look on the right, you have all these wonderful pictures from this yearbook, and then you have the names of people, but you don't know who is who. And that's really unfortunate. So, um, uh, just be aware of that because um, sometimes that happens. Okay, so now historical books. Um, we have many, many, and in, in the Arizona collection, there are many, many, many historical books that date back literally hundreds of years. And so um, what we do is we digitize them. Now you might think to yourself, okay, but like if my ancestor didn't write a book and my ancestor wasn't, didn't have some wild adventure that somebody else wrote a biography about them, why would this matter? And the answer to that is that these historical books tell us about the, um, the how people lived in a certain time period. Um, and that's really important because, um, Wendy, you have this wonderful saying that you say about um, the skeleton and the muscles. Can you say, hop on and say it really quickly? Sure. Um, I consider genealogy the, the um, skeleton of a structure and family history to be the muscles and the skin that goes over it. And these books can help you put the muscle and the skin on your bones. Exactly. Um, so I would highly recommend if you know the time period that your um, ancestors lived, especially in Arizona, um, I would recommend take a look through these historical books. There's beautiful illustrations. There's really interesting details about everyday life, and that could help fill in um, knowledge about your family and, and your family history. Um, and these are some other examples that we have. So um, a really interesting items. So it's not just historical books. It's also um, maybe you have a, um, an ancestor that was part of uh, the independent order of odd fellows in, during territorial times. Those are digitized. Um, perhaps you're, um, you have an ancestor who is part of the Arizona Federation of Women's Clubs. These are all things that are worth searching through um, to really fill in the gaps of what their lives were like. 
Next, periodicals. Um, these are fascinating um, because the periodicals in the Arizona collection range in topic massively. They, they cover all kinds of things and we're constantly digitizing them and we're adding more. Um, so these are also worth looking through, not just for everyday information, but they could also help you learn um, some basic details about your family. So let's take a look at an example. Um, I'm sorry, so here are a few examples. We have the Desert Grapefruit, we have Arizona, the New State Magazine, we have Arizona Builder and Contractor, and as you can see, the topics range very widely. So let's take a concrete example to see how these can be useful in figuring out information about your family. So um, in uh, con Arizona Contractor and Builder, they list permits for all um, just building permits um, and information about them. So if we look, for example, at the one with the arrow for Carl Bowers. So um, this was a, an addition to a cottage on Willetta Street. Well, then if you cross-reference that in the same year with a city directory for the city of Phoenix, again, for the same year, there is a CT Powers that lived on Willetta. Now that might not be exactly the same person, maybe there's a typo here or there, but you can make these very interesting connections and then maybe find out that actually um, Powers was your ancestor and there was just a typo here or vice versa, but how fascinating to know that maybe they added on to the cottage they were living in. Okay. So that was the Arizona collection. Now I wanna talk about the Arizona state government um, publications. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this because again, a whole presentation about this and the federal documents collection is available on our YouTube channel. But what I wanna say is that the Arizona state government publications are an, another excellent resource, resource to comb through. Um, uh, and these are publications that are published by um, Arizona State, the Arizona State um, bodies of government. So for example, well, I'll give you some examples, but the types of information this includes, and these are all very name heavy, are all kinds of reports and studies and audits um, and maps and handbooks, and most importantly, are the ones that are underlined on this list, because um, these are the ones that can really give you some um, more information to build that muscle um, about your family history, right? So we're going beyond the skeleton and really adding on more stories and history. Um, so here are some examples. Um, for example, the Department of Real, Real Estate uh, Bulletin. Um, and as you can see, and that's on your um, left, and that has pictures and all kinds of fun tidbits and information about the different things that are happening that happen in this department. Um, on the right is the Arizona Department of Economic S Security, DES. And I love that they called their newsletter the Describer. Um, um, <laughs> and here also you have a lot of information about, you know, um, what people were doing, um, different positions they had, promotions, um, all sorts of really interesting things. And these are pretty contemporary examples. These are both examples from the early 2000s, but um, there is information that dates back and there's thousands and thousands of documents on the Arizona Memory Project that are worth looking through. So that was AMP. And now we're gonna talk about two more resources um, that are worth considering. The Arizona Biographical Database, as you can see, the, the link is at the very top here on your screen, um, but that, that link is also on the handout. Um, this database is good if you, have, if you have an ancestor who was an Arizonan of note, which means that they um, were either very politically active, um, maybe they were part of a legislator, legislative um, office, maybe they um, uh, were um, very involved in social activism, things like that. And then we have, so you can search for them in this database. However, um, this database is not updated frequently and there is there are sometimes variations on a person's name. So for example, 
the, the names on this, this per, I just, we searched for um, Francis Munns, right? And we all know how, um, who Francis Munns is. And as you can see, um, her name is spelled differently almost on almost every line, um, which means that you have to, if you're going to use this database, I would recommend it as a first step and then contact us about what you find. Um, and we'll let you know what we actually have and don't have and what will help you kind of sift through this and work through this. Um, the Arizona Legislators Then and Now database, however, is updated regularly. Um, and it has all kinds of information about different people who were part of the Arizona Legislature um, since, um, well, since Arizona was a state. Um, so, um, and even, yeah, since Arizona was a state. So, um, this is also really helpful if you know that um, you have a um, ancestor who was part of the Arizona legislature. Um, and um, yeah, yes, that's it. So, um, so there's that. Um, now, we're going to switch gears just a little bit and we're going to talk about material that is found in both the library and the archives. Um, just because there's information that is both in the library and the archives does not mean that they are duplicates. It means that they often complement each other um, and we often work together um, to help patrons find what they're looking for. So we're gonna talk about a few examples of that. Um, the first example are if you are researching brands. So um, Arizona, as you know, one of the big C's uh, in Arizona is cattle. Um, and so all of the brand books, which here you can see examples of, of a brand book, these are all, they list the different brands, the different families and ranchers used, um, and they've all been digitized. They're available on the Arizona Memory Project. However, the archives has a complementary aspect to that, which is this. And Wendy, take it away. So as you can see, there's a bit of a difference. There's some more information here. It will show you, um, if you look at the, um, the right-hand side, I had to think which is my right hand and which is my left hand. Um, you can see who purchased it, where they were running their cattle out of. Um, and then if you look at the lower left-hand side, you can see exactly where on the cow they um, branded them. And um, the one that I um, blew up here does not have ear cuts, but sometimes if somebody had um, a popular brand of cattle that was known for being very good, someone else could um, get a brand that looked very similar and brand over it. And, rustle their cattle. However, you got away from that by doing ear cuts. Um, so they would cut little holes in the cattle's ears and I'm told it doesn't hurt, um, but I wouldn't wanna try it. Um, but that's another way that um, we can see it. And on the last page and up in the upper left-hand corner, you can see if somebody sells the brand to another person. And um, our index for brands has um, both a name index and a brand index. So if you knew that somebody was like a rock and two brand, you can actually look and see this brand and then you can find out who, who owned it. Okay, the arms you moving my slides for me. Um, so we have maps collections that overlap. So the library has published maps. So they'll have some, even some really great ones that you used to be able to pick up at gas stations that have adverts around the corner for, you know, different attractions. And the maps in the archives are maps that are original and created mostly by state, county, or local government entities. And so um, this is just a one of the, We've had a lot of people talk today about using lots of different maps in conjunction with one another. So we do have a collection of county road maps that will show you how county roads changed over time. Um, but one that's really particularly helpful for genealogy is the one that's on the bottom there that are um, land ownership maps. So when we look at those, we have them for a, a number of years. And so if you wanna to go to the, the next slide, you can see, um, um, you can see these roads and you can see this is Township 1 North, Range 1 West, um, and you can see who's owning these properties at this point. Um, the, since we have them for over a number of years, you can look and say, okay, F. Watts owned that, that property. They're kind of in the center of the um, 
Yes, thank you. Um, and over time, you can see that maybe he split that and sold half of it, or maybe he bought um, the property next to him. So you can start seeing how um, the finances and um, wealth of the family may have increased or decreased. You might even see him split it off and give it to a son or a daughter and her husband, but it can show that land ownership over time, just like we were talking about looking at um, maybe a uh, Sanborn map that might help you do the same with address changes and things like that. Okay, the, you know, these are the very bones of all of our, our genealogy, the birth, death, and marriage records. And, um, hey, go ahead. And so um, the birth records in Arizona are closed for 75 years and death records are closed for 50. But for those years that they're open, the um, health services has a really good um, search page. So you can search, you can type in, even if you just know the mother's last name and you know, you're like, this guy's name was spelled so many different ways. And some, I just had somebody ask me, they're like, I don't know if my grandfather's name was Carlos or if it was Roman. I've seen it both ways. So she had her grand, her great grandmother's maiden name and a rough estimate of the birth. And I was able to go in and find this birth certificate and he was named Carlos. Um, but our birth certificates are also up in um, Ancestry. So um, the one on the image on the left comes from the health services page and the image on the right, the same certificate um, comes from uh, Ancestry. And then this is a, a death certificate. This is how you would search it through um, Ancestry and you can search by type of record and county and, and the years. So now we're gonna get into court records and they're sometimes fun for people and they're sometimes not so fun for people because sometimes people like it when they have nefarious people in the family and sometimes they don't. <laughs> um, but our marriage records in Arizona aren't as necessarily helpful with information as um, marriage licenses and applications in other states. Um, you don't have to put down a parent's name or any other genealogical information. You put down your name, the bride's name, the groom's name, and you can get married. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of times if you have somebody who you know was living in California and Nevada and other states that surround Arizona and you're not finding them in that state, that you should really check out the, the edge counties in um, Arizona because we didn't have a requirement to wait. We didn't have a requirement for blood work, anything. You showed up at the courthouse and you said, I'm John, I'm Susan, we want to get married, fill out the certificate and you could get married. So we have um, Clark Cable and Carol Lombard's um, marriage license and certificate up in Mojave County because they were filming a movie in Nevada and decided to get married. So they just went into Kingman for the day, got married, and then went back and started uh, their filming again. And we do have consent forms um, for people who are under 18 getting married, usually to somebody over 18, um, but they will file those in and occasionally those will have a little bit more information about a single parent, a parent's name or both parents' names in it. So divorce records. Um, this is a um, screenshot of what's called a register of action. And we have registers of action for both civil and criminal cases. So it really helps when you don't know exactly when somebody either was prosecuted for a crime or got divorced because we'll have indexes to these a lot. And we can go and we can look and we can find out a case number from that that will then lead us to um, being able to actually find the case files. But in this, you can see what happens each day, what kind of activity happened um, in the case. And we do have some naturalization records, not a lot. Most of those, as we know, are going to be um, with um, NARA. But a lot of times people would record their petitions at the state or county level, at the county level. And then the final papers are pushed through um, the federal government. And wills and probates, are those are so much fun. You can find so much information on those. Um, and that's where naturalizations are usually found. Um, you can find um, in 
Wilson probates, in the probate cases, um, you can actually find um, insanity hearings for people who may be adjudicated um, less than mentally sound and sent to our state hospital for any number of reasons, some of them legitimate and some of them quite nefarious. We had one judge who would send his wife to the insane asylum every time he wanted to have an affair. And she miraculously recovered her sanity when he was done with his affairs. We do not by and large get school records here. Those are usually um, uh, kept at the school district level, but we do have a handful of records from charter schools. Um, and just a heads up, um, unless the charter school is one of the better known charter schools and longer lived charter schools, and you have a student going to a charter school, I would suggest you get um, certified copies of their transcripts, because about half the time when we look in these folders, there's no transcripts in them. So these kids can't prove that they graduated high school, which is really kind of sad. And school marshal censuses, we usually have these for the territorial times and they're very helpful. So you can look in the middle here and you can see that you can, all the students, yep, thank you. I was actually pointing it out on my screen like people could see me. Um, so you can see all the students listed under that one parent. So um, this is one of those things that can help you mid censuses understand what's going on. So we can see that um, Ramon was there and maybe between this is 1898. So maybe in the 1900 census, instead of having five kids, he only has four kids and we can try to figure out which kid is missing when we look at the next one. And then we can try to figure out, did he die? Did he move someplace else? Um, but it tells you their age and, um, and hold on, I got it. And, um, and you know, the ages of all their siblings. So again, it helps you with those, those kids that may have appeared or disappeared and it also helps you prove and correct ages um, that might be wrong on a census or something else. Assessment roles. I think there's, you're going to hear me say this a couple of times, but I think this is one of the most overlooked records because a lot of times people just think of assessments as how much taxes do I owe on my land and can I see if somebody's house is getting bigger and smaller and yes you can see that and it's those are very interesting things. But they can also help you find out other rights um, related to land that your ancestor may or may not have had. We had a woman come to the archives about 15 years ago, and her family had owned property up in Yavapai County around the Prescott area since the 1870s. And a state agency came to her and said, your family has been illegally using territorial and state water for all of these years. This is how much money you owe us for usage. This is how much you owe us in penalties. And this is how much you owe us in interest. And I'm going to tell you, it was well into seven figures. She came to us and she's like, I, I need help with this. And so we said, we'll look at it. We looked and we found where her, her family since the 1870s had been paid taxes on their water rights. And if you're paying taxes on something like that, you clearly own them. So we certified records. She took it to that state agency and the state agency said, oh, well, never mind. And so it's just one of those things that you don't always think about looking at. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's saves the day. And this is another um, type of, you can see that they're paying taxes on some of their personal property on here. And that's just the second half of that register. So great registers um, are really helpful. Um, we have them for most counties every two to four years. Um, and they're registered voters. And of course, before 1912 in Arizona, it'll only be men and it'll only be citizens. Um, but you can definitely, um, again, place people, you know, like they were in Arizona in 19, 1890 and they're not in 1910. When did they leave? You can start looking at these great registers and say, oh, you know, they were here for this long and they finally left at this time. And I don't know if you can see it well enough, but over on the right hand side, many times we'll even actually tell you the voters height and weight, which I don't know that I would really want to, to reveal about myself, but it's one of those things that 
Um, I'm grateful somebody did it at one time. Prison register. So we have um, these great resources um, and they, uh, sorry, the chat window keeps popping up and covering my screen. Um, so we do have some employee, this is the only time we have employee records is we have a couple of employee records for our prison, but our prison registers, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Oops, I don't have a, okay. This is just the list by date and by um, prisoner entry number. And it tells you when they went in, what they went in for and, and how they left. And next slide, I think I hope the, oh, I don't. So if you, could you go back two slides, sorry. Um, if you look at this one here, this on the, the right-hand side, you can see a picture of the, the convict. There's a section for tattoos that they may or may not have had, um, any unusual scars they had, um, what their legitimate occupation was, whether they smoked, whether they drank, whether they did drugs. Um, it can tell you if they're married, if they have children, and if they had been previously incarcerated, and if so, where they had been. But it also tells you about this great descriptions up at the top about how tall they were, what color their hair and eyes were, um, and they even have one for expression. And I'm not quite sure how one judges that, but it has their shoe size even. Um, and so it's really helpful. And sometimes, very sadly, it's the only image some people have of their ancestor is their prison photo. And then we have local census records, which is again, it sounds like a, a beating drum, but a lot of times people move around between either censuses or even registering to votes and things. So these, they do these, we have these um, county censuses that went through and sometimes they actually even helped um, cities move from being a town into a city. I just did some research like that for, for Yuma. They had to do um, a citywide census count every single person because they hadn't trusted the, the county census and they didn't trust the US census. So they went and they counted every single person so that they could move from being a town into being considered as a city. And that's what would the, it would look like on the inside, the ones that are handwritten. And you can see that some of them were, um, this is all people who were working at the vulture mine and how old they are and where they were born. County Recorder's Office. This is one of my favorite offices. Most people just think about going and looking for deeds or maybe abstracts of title or things like that. Um, but the County Recorder's Office, at least in Arizona, you can record anything that's legal. Um, so we do have homesteads. Um, we have um, people who you know, separate from the military. They register their DD2s there. But one of my favorite stories is that there's this rest of the street in Phoenix. It's on like this corner of Fillmore and Fifth Avenue. And there's a house there. It's now a restaurant. And this doctor and his wife lived there. And there was a man down the street who wanted to get a divorce. And as Mark showed us, there wasn't a lot of reasons sometimes that you could actually get a divorce. So this man went to court and he, he had a mistress and he went to court and said, my wife has abandoned me. She's been gone for two years. Um, I want a divorce. Well, the doctor's wife found out about this and she wrote a letter that I found in the county recorder's office. It says, he's a dirty liar. Um, I live down the street. I see her out doing her laundry. She's never left the home. And so it's those, I was so excited that day. I was like, it's, it's just a little piece of paper she registered, but I thought that is that muscle on the bone. And that's our history, our family history rather than our genealogy. And so they ended up not getting a divorce. I don't know why she wanted to stay with him, but she did. Um, and then while most of the records we've been talking about are records that you can probably find in most state libraries and state archives, Arizona had this really great, um, record called separate property of married women um and i think it's the next slide five and minutes so, wendy okay i'm trying to okay i want to wrap it up really quickly then um and so um as we all know most of the time in the late 19th and early 20th century when women got married their property became that of their husband 
Well, in Arizona, a woman could go to her, our county recorders and say, yes, I married so-and-so, but this is all the property that I'm bringing into the marriage with me. So this one, you'll see how she has horses and she has a lot of property. But I found one woman, I don't know why she married the man he did, because she listed three cotton dresses and two silver spoons as her property. Um, so I don't know what kind of man she married, but I don't think that I would want to be married to someone like that. Okay. Okay, so we do collect the um, government records for state, county, and local government agencies. We have some manuscript collections of private citizens, photographs, maps, and oral histories. We do not collect church or religious records or private business records. Um, Arizona has a collaborative online research thing for archives around the state. You can go in and you can type in George W.P. Hunt and you're going to find out that almost every repository in Arizona has something on Hunt, but you can at least see finding aids to tell you what um, is going to be there. Sorry, I'm speaking so fast. I'm trying to keep up. And so we just um, recently, um, one more, um, had our archives catalog go online. Um, and it, the search function is very similar to the memory project. And once you click in, you can limit by facets by type of record and date and things like that. Okay. Um, and this is the State of Arizona Research Library catalog where you could also find things um, find the materials that are in our catalog um, and as you can see there are finding aids um, and indices on this page it's going to be updated soon ish um, but this is a really great place to start also and then of course if you have any questions or you want to come in and uh, make an appointment to view anything in our reading room um, you can uh, email us at the email address um, on your screen or use the web form that's on your screen. And again, this is all of the links, everything, it's on the handout. So don't, don't it's okay. Don't, you don't have to write down everything, I promise. Um, so um, just get in touch with us and we hope to see you at our reading room soon. And that's all I've got. We've got, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yam and Wendy. As I said, I have seen that presentation from you before, but I learn something new every time. And I always really enjoy seeing those brand books. I think that's such an interesting thing. I'm not originally from Arizona. I moved here from Washington State, and so I didn't even know what a brand book was. Uh, so it's something I have learned since I've joined the State Library. Uh, it looks like we do have some questions in the chat. So if you guys are ready, I'll go ahead and pull that up. Okay, our first question. I am joining from Park Ridge, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, Illinois, but I was born in Phoenix and my family has lived in Southern Arizona since 1866. I am researching my ancestry for information. They came to Arizona from Maryland and Sonora, Mexico. So I think they're just looking for maybe any recommendations you guys might have for where to start with some research. Um. I would say I would definitely start with AMP um, if you the Arizona Memory Project. So if you know, uh, I mean, I, I assume that you know family names, uh, personal names. I, I would just start searching through things um, and seeing what you find. Then I would check probably, um, uh, and then I I think maybe sending us a message and asking us if if there's something specific that you want to look for, um, and then we can collaborate. Um, does does that sound about right, Wendy? Yeah, and also from um, our webpage for the the State Library and Archives, if you go in and you just search um, the word ancestry, if you don't have access to ancestry.com or ancestry library or can't get in to see us where we have Ancestry Institution, um, through a collaboration with the State Archives and Ancestry, um, any resident of Arizona can access the Arizona um, resources from us online from Ancestry for free. You just have to go, like I said, go to our main webpage, go into the search button, type Ancestry, it'll give you a link, and then you just have to put in your zip code, and you can search um, all of the archives um, information on Ancestry for free. Thank you, Wendy. And it looks like Corey just dropped that link in the chat for participants. Thank you. Yay. All right, next question. How does one go about getting a login account to research periodicals, yearbooks, et cetera? So uh, I'm assuming that you mean on, on the Arizona Memory Project, you do not need an account. 
Um, it does not cost any money to research on the Arizona Memory Project. You could just go on AZ Memory. Is it AZ? Now I can't remember exactly what it is, but no. the Arizona Memory Project. If you go AZ, on- It's azmemory.azlibrary.gov. Thank you. And Corey, awesome. just drop that link in the chat for us too. Thanks, Corey. <laughs> Thank you. It's so hard to like say it because I'm just so used to seeing it written. Anyway, um, you could just go and start searching. However, I would definitely recommend um, creating an account because then you can save things um, to your own, like you can make like a bookmark type of page. Um, so you can save all the things that you're interested in. Um, so I would definitely recommend making an account, but you don't have to. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question, and I'm happy to help answer part of this, Yam. Uh, do the federal records include information on the Civilian Conservation Corps as part of President Roosevelt's National Recovery Act? My grandfather uh, was at the Rim Rock CCC camp in 1933. You can absolutely uh, answer that, Janelle. <laughs> So uh, as part of my role, I also manage our federal documents collection. So I can generally say uh, that we do have materials about the Civilian Conservation Corps in that collection. They're primarily going to be um, reports more broadly that cover camps uh, across the United States. So they might mention some Arizona locations, uh, but we don't have a lot in the federal documents collection that's Arizona specific. However, I think, Yam, there may actually be some publications um, in the Arizona collection. I don't know if they specifically cover that camp uh, from that time period, uh, but there might be some materials in our collection. And Wendy, I don't know if there's anything in the archives about the Civilian Conservation Corps. We have the CCC um, newsletters, but they're not indexed. Um, okay. And so there's like about 12 rolls of microfilm and it covers CCC camps here and elsewhere. And so it's literally, it is a needle in a haystack. And, but if you enjoy looking through CCC newsletters page by page, you can come in and look at a microfilm. Great. So we do have some things in both collections. I think that would be another great one to follow up with us and we can see what we can help you find. Yep. Email us. Uh, how often do you add birth certificates? Um, and then they put 1920 for uh, Pinal County to your online collection. Okay, so that online collection is through Department of Health Services, um, and they don't generally add new ones. If you have somebody from Pinal County in 1920 for whom you're not finding a birth certificate, it's probably because they got a delayed birth certificate. And many times, not all the times, but many times when um, someone applied for a delayed certificate, they didn't go back and file it with their year of birth, they filed it with the year for which it was in which it was applied. So if they applied in 1940, it might be with the 1940s or even later, I had someone recently looking for one that was done in the 1970s, even though it was for a 1920s birth. So it doesn't appear online because they filed it with the 1970 birth certificates. Now that doesn't always happen. I just found, found some the other day that were delayed and were in the correct year. But many times if you're not finding them, that's why. Great, thank you, Wendy. Uh, the next question is, do assessment roles apply to homesteads? Frequently, but not always. It's always just a good thing to ask. And that ask a question button, we monitor that five days a week. We do not monitor it on the weekends. They do give us that time off. Um, but there's at least one librarian and one archivist um, checking it pretty much. I check it up every 15, 30 minutes. So that's the best place to go ahead and put those questions. Great. Thanks for that reminder, Wendy. Uh, the next question was just asking how to access handouts. So just a reminder for everyone, handouts were emailed uh, in advance of the event today. However, um, Corey has also been dropping those in the chat throughout the day, and I believe they may be circulated again post-event. So you'll have a few different opportunities to access those. Uh, this next question is, do most states have similar records? 
I'm not sure what records yes. they're referencing, but they do. Actually, they yeah. do, um, but not all of them go to the state archives. So we only have 15 counties here, and we don't have a whole bunch of people. Um, so state, county, and local rec government records come to us. But in states like California and Texas, they are so large, and they have such a large population that they will either have most of their records in a county archives, or they'll have them in a regional state archives, where there's one central state archives, and then there's like assistant state archives around the state. But most of the time, you will have very similar records. They're just sometimes called different things. So if you are doing research in other states, um, we do recommend that you search for whatever state that is, their archives, their state library, um, their historical societies, and then usually they'll have information about what they have and what they don't have, and then um, reach out to them. Um, I, I also, just a really quick thing, when you're doing research at um, any kind of historical society archive library, um, uh, check in with them first to see what they have. Um, and also ask them if you need to make an appointment ahead of time. And if it is optional, I highly recommend making an appointment because the great thing about that is if you make an appointment and you tell them what you want to look at ahead of time, it will be waiting for you there, like amazing room service. Um, as, whereas if you just show up, it might take time for them to pull stuff out of their archives and stuff. So, um, or they a, might not have what you're looking for. Right, right. So get in touch ahead of time. We'd love knowing. When, and most and most of the time, librarians and archivists throughout a state work so closely with one another that if I don't have what you're looking for, and I think I know where it exists, I will definitely send you there and say, oh, go talk to the Historical Society or go talk to NAU or... Yeah. Those are great reminders. Uh, this next question came through the chat. I am ghostwriting a memoir for a 99-year-old who grew up in Oracle, Arizona, and who was born in a now ghost town called Johnson, Arizona. Where do you recommend starting since these are not, nor were they, large towns? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would recommend... Um, I would start with newspapers. Message. I really would. Yeah, yeah, newspapers, definitely. Um, there might be some periodicals. Um, we also have vertical files that might be of use. Maybe vertical files are like uh, literally files in a filing cabinet um, that have all sorts of newspaper clippings, uh, brochures, all kinds of random stuff. Um, and so we might have something in there. Um, I don't know well, off the top of my head. And, and court records, again, you know, for, for mm -hmm. even, even though these towns are small towns and may not exist anymore, if, if uh, this person remembers stories and wants them verified about, oh, so-and-so was such a bad guy. He, you know, shot his neighbor. Um, those will be in our court records, even though it's from a small town. And so I, I just get your list of questions like Yam said earlier. And I, I know I'm a, a broken record on this, but the ask a question button is the best place to start. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely is, Wendy. Uh, okay, so the next question is, when buying a gold claim, is there a deed recorded in the county? I don't know if that's something you know, Wendy. Are you, I'm, I'm assuming that they're looking for like mining claims. And we do have in the county recorder's office there, um, they do record mining claims. Great, and if that's you, good and if, it's, and if it was in Maricopa County, um, all of Maricopa County's recorded um, documents are online from 1871 when the county was organized until the most recent ones. And it's really easy to search through their, um, their website. Great. Uh, the next question, do you loan items such as books to other repositories? Um, so um, the, we only, do, so it's called interlibrary loan, ILL. Um, and so we only do that if we have two copies of something. And that's generally only, almost always only books um, for the Arizona collection. Um, I think other collections work a little bit differently. Um, do you, Janelle, do you know um, how that works for Fed Docs or newspapers? Yeah. It does vary a bit by collection, uh, specifically for federal documents. We tend to loan um, almost anything that we have, and that's whether or not we have two copies. So sometimes we may have only one copy and we do still lend it, uh, but that's a bit unique for the federal documents collection. There are, um, 
as you said, different restrictions for each type of collection. So really the best thing to do is to contact us about the item that you're interested in. Um, and then typically, as Yam mentioned, we tend to work directly with another library. So you would want to work with your local public library, genealogy library, academic library uh, to put in that request for lending if there is something that you're, you're hoping that we have to lend. And the archives don't lend, we're stingy. <laughs> well, just very unique, delicate material. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, that looks like that is it for the chat. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to add before we wrap up? Um, I don't think so, except, uh, you know, we really hope to see you in our reading room. Please get in touch with us uh, with your questions and your research and uh, share let all of your other colleagues and family members and friends know that we are here to answer all of your questions and research needs as best as we can. Sometimes we don't know the answer, but we try really hard to find the answer. You're absolutely right, Ram. You, we do. Um, it looks like one question just came in uh, as I was about to wrap up. Uh, it says, one of my cousins was supposedly a bounty hunter in the 1870s to 1880s. Where might I find information? That would be one of those questions that um, we would get in and I would sit down as the lead um, reference archivist and I would work with our lead um, reference librarian and we would start looking through things we'd want to name um, and some other stuff like that. So we would look through, um, it was just a good question to put in to ask a question, but um, it depends on if they actually ever caught someone because then they'd be in a newspaper and then we can at least start looking from there. And it depends on what information you would want about your bounty hunting ancestor. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds like fascinating. It could be juicy though. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Please contact us so we can all learn more together. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you both so much. I know you've reiterated it a few times, but um, if you need to follow up with any additional questions for the library or the archives, uh, the contact information is here on the screen. And as we said at the top of the session, this session was recorded. It will be shared with participants uh, later today via email. I think there will be a link where you can access it along with the other sessions. I have so, one more really quick thing. Yeah, um, go just, ahead, Wendy. Just in case you know you have something delicate in your family that you'd rather you know you want to know about, but you'd rather not everyone know it about. Please understand that. Share as much information as you can with your librarian or your archivist you're working with because we both in, um, industries have a code of ethics that we're not allowed to share the information you ask us about or the information we find for you unless you tell us we can. So um, don't be don't don't hesitate to share because that just gives us better resources to be able to help you. Great reminder, Wendy.